In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to make this festive cushion cover. There are techniques you're going to learn as well. If you're new to sewing, you're going to learn about piping. We're going to do free motion embroidery on the applique, and the zipper on the back is completely concealed underneath the flat, so it gives a, a really nice, neat finish. And of course, you can change it up. You can embellish, you can use whatever colour that you like. You could add ribbons or um, decorations, whatever you like to make it your very own. I haven't given you specific measurements for fabrics for this one, but I have explained how with my cushion pad I've measured the amount of fabric that I need, because I'm kind of thinking you might not have a cushion pad to exactly the same size. You may prefer to make a squarer one, it may be a larger or a smaller rectangular one. Um, so again, no specific fabric measurements for these, but I'm sure um, you can understand how to measure for your own cushion size. They would make different sizes, that would look nice as well. Okay then, so that's what we're going to make. I think it's about time we got sewing. My cushion pad measures 16 inches across by 12 inches deep, but this cushion cover is designed around whatever size of cushion pad that you're using. Um, so I'll explain generically how I, I get the sizes for what I'm using. I'm using a five fat quarter pack. I like packs of pre-cut fabrics like this because I know that everything's going to match together. And this works particularly well because I've got two reasonably plain fabrics for the background and then for the baubles I can make those nice and bright so they really stand out against the, um, against the background. I'll put one plane in there as well just to break it up a little bit. So my fabric, I like to cut to about half an inch or a centimetre larger all the way around than my cushion pad and then have that half inch or centimetre seam allowance so it brings the cushion cover to the same size as the pad and that means that my cushion is going to be nice and plump and full. That's just the way I like it. If you like your cushions a little bit flatter then add maybe an inch or two and a half centimetres and then use your centimetre or half an inch seam allowance and then you'll have a flatter kind of finish but this one's going to be nice and flat and plump. Um, so do the same if you're cutting a square. You cut your fabric to a centimetre or half an inch bigger than your cushion pad. Um, what I am going to do with this one is to use two fabrics on the front. So I've chosen the plainer two of the fat quarters. That's going to be the front. I'll join those together in a second. Um, one fat quarter is big enough for the back of my cushion. I've got a much too long zip. This is part of a continuous zip um, or an endless zip and um, it is perfect for these kind of projects because on these type of zips you don't have the stoppers, the metal stoppers on the end which I don't like to use anyway. If you're using a regular zip make it a couple of inches or five centimeters or so longer than your cushion uh, width um, and then we can chop off those metal stoppers so we're not working around those. It, that always works really well. Um, I also have some piping, which is shop-bought. You can make your own if, if you wish. I'm sure I've got a video on making piping. Um, but this is a shop-bought piping, so it's really, really easy to work with. And that's going to go around the edge of my cushion cover. And feet you need on your sewing machine. I'm going to free motion embroider, so I'll need a free motion embroidery foot, which looks something like this. It may be a little different on your sewing machine. Um, Sometimes they've got closed toes, sometimes they're made from metal, but in general this is what it looks like. Now you don't have to use free motion embroidery for the applique here. You could use a zigzag stitch, which if you shorten it so you've got a very tight stitch, that's a satin stitch which gives you a solid outline. You could just use a running stitch because I'm going to use heat and bonds or bond a web, a fusible adhesive with my applique so it's not going to fray. So I don't have to worry about making a very tight stitch around the edge of the shapes. But if you're free motion embroidering, or free machine embroidering, or a darning stitch it's sometimes called, that's the foot that you're going to need. I've got the standard foot, which is on your sewing machine when you first get it home, and I will need my zipper foot as well. Um, with zips, I'm not too fussed about using a zipper foot, I don't always do that, but with piping, I really will need to take the stitch line right up to the edge of the piping, so a zipper foot is important, you will need one of those, but you should have one of those with your sewing machine anyhow. What I also need are some circular templates, and I've just got a couple of ribbon bobbins, but you could use a small, a small plate or anything that you've got that is round. Um, I've got two different sizes, so one's about three inches and one's about four. It really doesn't matter 
the size of them uh, to be exact, as long as they fit quite nicely across your cushion cover. So I'm sure you've got something without having to go out and buy anything to make your templates with. For the baubles, I've cut some pieces of fabric already. Now some of my fabric, quite luckily, um, has um, images on it, like the doves here, which I'm going to fussy cut. So in other words, I'm going to cut out the shape. Now that, that isn't a circle, but what, I'm going to place my ribbon bobbin over the top and cut a circle around it. So I've got two um, facing doves on my fabric. You may not have that, it doesn't really matter. I don't have that on the snowflakes and I won't have that on the, on the plain red, of course, but that, I'm just going to use those because I happen to have those on the fabric that I'm using. And I will need an erasable marker pen. I'm using a friction pen, always test first, because sometimes they can bleach your fabric. Um, otherwise, you could use a chalk pen, water erasable or heat erasable. Bear in mind that water and heat erasable pens become permanent if you iron them. So make sure you don't need to iron your work while you're using those. And that is about it. So we're going to get started. I'll put my backing fabric to one side for a second. And although I've got two very large fat quarters I'm going to sew together, I'm going to do this first before I cut out the size of my, um, my cushion pad. So let's have those right sides together here. A flip over this way. And I'm literally going to sew these together. Um, do double check if you have a, a, a cutting mat that your cutting line is square. Sometimes fat quarters aren't cut to exactly square lines. They can be a little bit wobbly, so just make sure that that's right. Let's put my standard foot on my sewing machine. And I'm just going to sew these together with about a half an inch seam allowance, doesn't really matter. Then I'm going to press the seam open. Just pull those apart and press. Right, then I'll take my measurements from my cushion pad and cut the fabric to size. So Normally I'd have this at the big ironing board, but um, for speed's sake, and so you can say what I'm doing, I'm just using a tiny little pad here, which is fine, it works. Um, so let's press this from the right side just to make it neat. And then I'm going to sew each side of that seam for no reason apart from I think it looks nice and I think it gives a really nice finishing touch and it gives a, a professional finish. So I'm going to sew about a quarter of an inch each side of the seam just in a straight line and I can elongate my stitch now to, I'm going to go up to a three because this isn't a seam, it's a top stitch. So let's Start again there and lengthen the seam and so. And I'm only using a pale grey thread, so this isn't outstanding. And I could use red, but I just wanted this to be quite subtle. But it does give a nice finish to your work. It'll hold the seam flat, but as you can see there, it just looks, looks a little bit more shop bought when you have attention to detail like this. And the same with the opposite side. And I'm just using a part of my sewing machine foot that I know is about a quarter of an inch. If you've got a quilting foot for your sewing machine, then that'd be a good idea to use it. Just to help you sew in a straight line.
Now I'm going to have my plainer fabric on the top and my more dense fabric on the bottom of my cushion pad. But I want that to be not straight down the centre. I'm going to have it maybe like so. So I've got a third of the fabric at the top in the pale colour and two thirds in a little bit denser. So let's take my cutting mat. And again, I normally have a bigger one than this. And I'm just going to cut, let me measure that roughly here. So remember I've got a 12-inch pad, 12 inch in this direction. So I'm going to go for, actually it's 12 and a half to be exact, 12 and a half inches. So I'm going to go for five inches above the seam and the rest of it below the seam. So I'm just lining up the five inch mark on my ruler across the seam here. Obviously if you're using a centimetre ruler or you work in centimetres not inches you'll have the equivalent in centimetres. I'll pop those on the screen. And cut. Oops, looks like I need a new blade in that one. And five inches. There we go. So that fabric is spare now. So if I'm five inches at the top to make up my 12 and a half inches, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine, nine, twelve, seven and a half inches. So this time I'll need to use my mat to get an accurate measurement. So I'll fold this so that the seam matches up here. You can cut large fabric pieces on a small mat if you fold correctly. And this fold line here needs to be square with the mat. So I've lined up my seam here on the one inch, then I'm going to measure seven and a half inches across. And then of course I need to add my seam allowance as well. So we'll go six, seven, seven and a half, eight and a half inches. So remember this is the size of your cushion pad plus half an inch all the way around. So that's an inch in total. So the measurements of your cushion top will be an inch bigger than the measurement of your cushion pad. So there I've got the smaller section at the top, the larger section at the bottom. Just going to make sure that that end is square, which it is. And then in this direction, my sh cushion pad was 16 inches. So I need to measure 17 inches. So again, I'll fold that in half because it's too big for my little mat. Make sure the seams match and this side is straight. So if my cushion pad is 16, I need to measure 17. I've folded my fabric in half, so I'll need to half the 17, which is eight and a half. So that six, seven, eight and a half will be here. If you have a larger cutting mat, then it's a lot easier to cut that without doing the maths and folding it in half. But basically that's the shape that I've now got. And that will be half an inch bigger, or just over a centimetre bigger all the way around than my cushion pad. So let's cut out the baubles. Now I've put my bonder web onto the wrong sides of the shapes or the fabrics that I want to use for the applique. 
So we'll move that out of the way for the moment. So I now need to cut out some circles. I'm just doing circular baubles. If you're a bit more adventurous, then you can make any shape that you like. Um, I'd normally draw onto the back of these pieces because that's the paper side, so it's easy to draw onto. With even a ballpoint pen, you don't need anything special. But because I'm fussy cutting around the doves here, I'm going to use a heat erasable pen. This is a friction pen. And I'm not worried about, you know, friction pens sometimes can bleach fabric. I'm going to cut just inside the pen line, so it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to place my circle template, and this is my four inch template, right over the top of the area that I want to cut. And we'll draw around the edge. And then cut it out. Now obviously there's not going to be so many fabrics that have the perfect shape and size to fussy cut like this. So just cut circles. And you can have as many of those as you like in lots of different sizes as well. They don't have to be the four inches. These are particularly large. So there's one. And then I happen to have a dove facing in the opposite direction. So we'll do this one. The bonder web on the back of this um, is a fusible adhesive sheet, if you haven't seen these before. And um, the way that they work, they have like a shiny side or a rough side to them and paper on the back. So the shiny rough side is the adhesive side and you'll iron that onto the back of your fabric. You can do it either way, either from the top of your fabric or from the back of your fabric, doesn't really matter. Um, and then you've got paper on the back. We scratch this off and then there'll be a, a shiny bit which is glue, it's not sticky at that point, then you can re-iron that onto your work. And the beauty of it is, it, um, it makes a really good adhesion and helps to stop your fabric from fraying. So if you don't want to do a very tight stitch when you're sewing on your applique, you don't need to. Because unless this is going to be rigorously washed, actually you don't even need to sew it. I think you should because it looks nice when you sew it. Um, but it just means you don't have to have a very tight seam around the edge. And it's not going to fray. So again, I've done a, a smaller circle in the plain red. I've made a couple. I might not use them, but I've made them anyway. Um, and experiment with different shapes. If you're quite good at drawing, you could make the, the longer shapes, the teardrop shaped baubles. They don't have to all be round. And I think, I think I'll have one large and one small of the snowflake fabric. I think I might have cut too many, but if I could draw on the back of these. Because I'm not fussy cutting, I could have drawn on the paper backing. I'll do that with the next one. And then we can arrange them on the front of the cushion cover and see how they look before you commit to ironing them in place. So there's that one, and then we'll have a smaller one as well. I can just use a ballpoint pen for this. This bonder web is really good if you're making intricate applique pieces as well, because on the areas that you can't sew, maybe you're making snowflakes, and it can be very difficult on those tiny little areas um, to sew all of the edge of the fabric down in place, but this really helps to keep it stuck down. Right, so there's my baubles. Let's take my fabric and arrange them. So I, I do want to have the two doves on there. And then maybe the smaller baubles, one of the larger ones. Bear in mind, you're going to have a seam allowance and your cushion's going to be fat, so don't put them too far to the top. You can overlap them. And not too far to the side as well. And actually, I think that that arrangement looks quite nice. Maybe a little bit higher with that one. So when you're happy with the 
like that. When you're happy with the way that it looks, you can then take the backing off. And now I did notice as I was um, cutting those, some of these haven't been ironed on enough to really make the backing stick. So I'm just going to go over them. And that one's not quite round. it no steam when you're using this one you don't need it just a, as hot an iron as your fabric will take which with cotton is pretty hot now then the easiest way to take the backing off is to give the center of the fabric a little bit of a scratch and just peel away the paper backing and you'll see this like rubbery shiny coating on the back of the fabric and that's the glue it's not sticky at this point it won't actually stick until I re-iron this back on again so I can take off all of the paper backing for each one of these pieces you don't have to use a point of scissors you could just use a, a little pin to scratch the back if you prefer so we'll take all of those off and then stick them in place. So one, two, three, I've got six all together. Now of course you don't have to use um, traditional Christmas fabrics for these. They would look very stylish in a black and white and maybe a metallic embroidery thread would look good or reds and greens, whatever colour um, of Christmas decor that you're using. You could use white with a pale grey bauble. You could use very neutral tones with beiges and even things like um, a hessian or burlap would look nice in the background and make this a really rustic kind of look. I think the look of it changes dramatically depending on the type of fabric that you're using. You could use very bright colours for the baubles on a plain background. So. Have a think about what kind of fabrics you have available. Um, a five, four, five quarter pack is a very useful thing for cushions like this because all of your fabrics match. But if you wanted to use up some of the fabrics that you already have, then a, a mix and match of lots of different um, colours and styles of fabric would work really well. So normally, again, I'd be at my larger ironing board when I'm doing this so I can get the whole cushion pad on the board at the same time. So I was going to go circle there, again not too close to the edge. You could if you wanted to lay all of these down individually and embroider around them individually. I'm going to do them all together. Um, where did I put that? There was one here. So I, when I embroider I'm just going to avoid like on this circle, I'll go from here to here instead of going all the way around. So um, it gives a depth. Let's have another one here. This looks a little bit different to the plan, but still looks nice. So I need to move those across. Just balance it all out a little bit. There, I think that works well. And then iron them in place. And again, no steam, hot iron. Just hold it down for a few seconds and the glue on the back of your bonder web will melt and stick all of the sections together. Red fabrics tend to go a little bit dark when you iron them, but they do recover. Right. So those are all well and truly stuck down and they will stay stuck down even after washing. But I still think it looks nice to have a few stitches around there. Now this is going to be quite subtle. Um, I like when I'm doing free motion embroidery to use a really strong colour to outline them. So maybe a dark grey, a dark brown or a dark blue. But I'm going to use pale grey because this is going to be quite a, a subtle decoration. Um, what I do need to do is to draw in where the ribbons are going to go. So I'm just going to draw with my erasable pen, could be a chalk pen, whatever you choose to use, this just happens to be a friction pen. 
and I'm going to draw a line from the centre of each one of those baubles up to the top. So right there in the centre, up to the top. Instead of just doing circles, you could add, you know, those little toppers that um, baubles sometimes have with like a, a, a scallop shape around them. Draw those on and embroider over them. You could do a zigzag line from one side to another. You could add ribbons to it. You could do some of the decorative stitches on your sewing machine, maybe. So there's lots of different ways that you can embellish this. I think with the pattern fabric I'm using here, that's pattern enough, to be honest. But if you're using all plain colours, it might be quite nice to add the little bits of ribbon, or even if you're free motion embroidering and do a zigzag line from one side to another, that would look quite nice as well. But we're going to keep this one quite simple. Now, because I'm embroidering over cotton, which is quite flimsy, I need to put some stabiliser behind there, and that's going to help the um, stitches to stop kind of tightening up as I'm sewing. So I'm just going to use some tear-away stabiliser. To be honest, my, I don't have sheets big enough to cover the whole thing, so I'm going to use a few. Um, but this will tear away afterwards, it's no problem. Um, I would recommend this for any kind of embroidery, so I'm just going to spray the back of this with a little bit of 505 spray, which is a repositionable spray adhesive. So I can sew through it, it's designed for use with fabric. And I'm just going to place that over the back of the areas that I'm sewing through. One big sheet would be ideal. If, you're, uh, if you prefer, you could use a sewing stabiliser, but it, I think it does need some kind of backing on here. Otherwise, you'll find that, again, the stitches tighten up as you're sewing. With this one, I can sew straight through it. It doesn't matter about the, the 505 spray, designed for a sewing machine, sew straight through that and... Um, tear it away afterwards, then that will help to keep my stitches nice and flat. Just smooth that out a little bit. So I need to put the um, darning foot, free motion foot, on my sewing machine. You may need a screwdriver to attach this. So I'll take off the, the ankle, which is the bit that holds the foot on, and pop the free motion foot onto the machine. Make sure the little bar on the foot sits over the top of the needle clamp because that's what helps the foot bounce up and down. That goes on there. I need to lower the feed dogs. Some of your machines don't have that facility. You'll have a plate that covers over the top of the feed dogs and that's fine. And I'm going to use some quilters gloves. Now don't rush out and buy these for one cushion cover. But if you're going to do a lot of free motion or quilting, then these are perfect. They've got little silicone tips on them, so they're really grippy, and it helps you to move the fabric around underneath the needle. But they also help to stop grease from your hands getting on your work. So I know you can't see perfectly from there what I'm going to do, but I'm basically going to sew down the lines that I've drawn and around the circles, and I'm going to go over those lines two or three times, because I think you can be very, very specific and precise with a perfect line that goes around the circle. And that's amazing if you've got the patience. I don't. So I think if you go around two or three times, it looks quite scribbly, and I, I like that kind of look. It's a very freeform kind of thing. So foot down. My machine's beeping at me because it's alerting me that the feed dogs are down, but I want them down, that's fine. And then move your fabric. So my machine's going to sound a little bit noisy now because it's sewing through the fabric, the bonder web and the backing. That's fine. Um, I've got a new needle in there. I know it's all going to be great. The idea is that you keep your fabric moving. If you don't move the fabric, the feed dogs aren't working. So you'll have a big bunch of thread where it's sewing on top of itself. So if you can try and keep the movement consistent, you'll have a consistent length of stitch. If you move your fabric very quickly, the stitcher will be long stitcher, the stitches will be longer. And if you move your fabric slowly, the stitches will be shorter. You can go up, down, round and round, any direction you like. One other thing to bear in mind is relax your shoulders. I do it all the time. I find that I'm scrunched over and concentrating on what I'm doing and the tension builds up in your shoulders and I have to sit back and think, Woo, no, back with those shoulders. So let's start. So I'm going to go round in a circle. You don't have to be exact and you don't have to be precise. And that's all part of the look. 
So it doesn't matter if you go off the applique and onto the fabric. It doesn't matter. It does look better if you can keep your stitches at a consistent length. So back up to the top and we'll cut. And look, it's a scribbly circle. That's exactly what I want. Now with the second circle here, it's overlapping slightly. So I'm just going to go from one bauble round and back. And back so I've gone over there three times. And stop. You can sew over itself for a couple of times when you finish if you like. It's a bit of a cheats way because you can't reverse on this, obviously. And let's do the ribbon. Again, this is all going to be quite subtle because I'm using grey. If you wanted to use a bold colour, even red would look really nice. With red fabric. Um, practice on some scrap fabric first of all if you've never done this technique before. But if you have, you'll know how enjoyable this is. I, I, I love free motion embroidery. Just taking my, checking my bobbin thread because uh, it does use up a lot of thread and I don't want to run out just yet. Okay, back down the ribbon. at any point stop with the needle down and spin this around so you can sew in the opposite direction if you wish and cut so however you feel comfortable So that's what we have. Now again, if you wanted to embellish, if you want to put little ribbons on here, maybe a zigzag stitch around the planar bauble, that is entirely up to you. This is just a, it's actually a very simple, very basic cushion cover. I'm just going to iron away my uh, friction pen line. So this is going to be a little bit more subtle now. And again, if you wanted that bold, maybe a red thread would have looked good. But I just want to keep this really, really simple. And then there's the fun bit. We can tear away the stabiliser from the wrong side. So that folded over, that's fine. There are so many stitches on here, you can be quite brutal when you're tearing this away. And just like with the bonder web, if I can't get to the centre very easily, I can just give that a scratch with a pin or the end of my scissors to get in there to tear it away. It's quite nice not having the residue of uh, stabiliser left behind because um, you've still got a softness to the fabric. If you have a, a stabiliser that's going to stay in, it can feel a little bit stiff. Which is fine, oh, there we go. Which is fine if you're making a bag or something like that. It doesn't matter if it feels a bit stiff. But on a cushion cover or something that you're going to lean against and you want it to feel nice and soft, then um, it's nice to have, I think, the tear away. Okay, that's almost gone. Just the middle of this one to go. A little bit round here. There we go. That's it, all gone. I'm going to press over those stitches just one more time, just to smooth this out a little bit. And then we can put the piping around the edge.
there. Now again, I've used a shop bought, a shop bought binding, piping. It's uh, very simple to make your own, but it's even more simple if you buy some. Um, and it's quite fine. So what I need to do, I haven't measured this out because I've bought a whole roll, but make sure you have enough to go around all four sides and then overlap a bit. So I'm going to make my join in the centre at the bottom. So that's too long, which is fine. And what I am going to do is to just undo a few of the stitches from along here. I'll just use a pin to do that. They're quite long stitches. So I can expose some of the cord in the centre. Like so. And then I'll do the same with the other end when I get there. Because when I when the, the two ends meet, I don't want to see a join. I want that to be as invisible as I possibly can. So let's take off my free motion embroidery foot. Pop the ankle back on and this is when I need the zipper foot on my machine. So pop that back on here and don't forget to put your feed dogs back up again. Like so. Sometimes on sewing machines if you haven't dropped your feed dogs before they don't come up straight away but when you start sewing or if you turn the handrail towards you they, they pop up then. So don't think that your mechanism is broken. Right, so I need to move the needle over to the left-hand side slightly as well. If you have a digital or computerised sewing machine and you adjust the stitch width on the machine, that can take the needle from one side to the other. So I want to move my, my needle a little bit over to the left-hand side so I can sew close to the piping. So I'm going to start in the centre bottom. I've already got a crease mark there where the centre is. And leave a bit of fabric dangling around there to, to help with the join. And then you take the edge of the piping fabric, so raw edges together with the edge of your cushion cover, cover fabric. And we're going to sew quite close to the piping. We will get closer in the next stage, so don't worry too much about being right next to the piping. So start to sew. Try not to pull this. It's very easy because most of this is cut on the bias and it's very easy to stretch it and we don't want that. So we'll sew until we just get a little way from the corner and then I'm going to snip into the edge of the fabric up to the stitches, not through it. And this is going to help me sew around the corner nice and smoothly. So carry on sewing until I get closer and then bend the edge of the fabric around the corner. You're never going to get a 90 degree corner when you're using piping like this. It will always be slightly rounded. But when you cut into the seam allowance like that, it means that you have a nice smooth round curve without it pulling. So again, don't pull your piping. Keep it nice and flat, raw edges together and we'll carry on sewing. Whoops, I've just, just come off it there. Get it back on. Maybe move that needle over a little bit further. And then I'm coming up to the next corner here. And again, let's just stop a little while, maybe a couple of inches or 15 centimetres or so beforehand, snip into the curve, not through the stitches, but up to them. So a nice sharp pair of scissors is going to be beneficial there. Let's get a little bit closer. Turn this around so the raw edges are still meeting. And we'll do this until we get back to where we started sewing from. As I'm coming back up to where the two pieces meet, I'm going to stop sewing just before then and cut off the excess piping. 
So I've got an overlap like this. Okay. Don't worry about getting too close to the piping at this stage because when we put the back of the cushion cover on, that's when we're going to make it nice and neat and tight against the piping. But I don't want to see an overlap of piping. I want this joint to be as invisible as it possibly can be. So I'm going to take one side of the piping and undo some of the stitches. You can use your quick unpick or a pin or a nice sharp pair of scissors. And I'm going to cut the piping back inside the fabric by about two and a half centimetres or an inch. And then I'm going to fold the edge of that fabric back again by about half an inch. So I've got a nice neat, neat edge here and my piping is just short of where the fold is. So there's the neat edge and my piping is about here, so it's about a quarter of an inch in. And then with the section that's coming from the opposite direction, I need the two ends of the cord to butt up against each other, not overlap and not be too short. They need to be exact. So if I measure, or I can feel, where the end of my piping is here, I'm going to cut at the same point on the piping here. Now, if you've not done this before, make it a little bit too long and then cut it down. Because if you cut too much off at this point, you're going to have a gap and you need to fill it in because it'll, it'll go flat. We need these two ends to match it perfectly. So when I put nav, I open up the piece that I've just folded and place the second piece inside, the two ends of my piping meet up perfectly. So then I can wrap this over, make this a nice tight joint, and then I'm just going to carry on sewing. So it's better to cut that a little bit too long and keep shaving little pieces off until they meet than cut it too short and have to fill the gap in. To be honest, this is such a narrow binding, you probably wouldn't notice, but it's, it's just nice to get it right, isn't it? So there I've got a nice neat join, and when that's actually on the right side, you'll barely see that there's any join there at all, which is what we wanted. Okay, so that's the front. We're going to put that to one side for now to make the back of the cushion cover. So, put the lid on there. We need this cut to the same width, but then longer to accommodate the zip going across the centre. So I can use this as a kind of guidance there. So let's take my rotary cutter. Now it doesn't matter again if, the, if, your, oops, if your backing is bigger than the top because all of this can be trimmed down to size later. I'd rather you make the back of the cushion cover a little bit too big so that it can be cut down than try and cut exactly and then have a problem because it's a little bit too short. So let's take my rotary cutter. Do you know I put things down Oh, there it is. Don't move from the spot, but they'll just disappear. Um, and I'm going to cut the whole length of this fat quarter because I need the back to be longer than the front. So I'll cut to the width first of all. And this is the same for any size of cushion cover that you're making. Maybe a square one, larger or smaller than the cushion that I'm making here. So the width of the backing fabric is the same or a little bit bigger than the width of the front. And then I'll need to cut this side about 3 inches or 15 centimetres longer. I'm going to leave that just as it is. It is too big, but again, we'll cut it down to size later. And then this is simply going to be cut in half widthways. I've already got a crease line down here, so I'm simply going to cut over that crease line and cut it in half. Oops. Like so.
So the zip is going to go in between those two sections. So we'll take said zip. Because I'm using a way too long zip, I can actually take the slider right out of the way while I'm sewing, which really helps. And we're going to have the zip facing down. So right sides together, as in that's your slider, face it down over your fabric and sew along that zip toe. This is a really long zip. You don't need to have one this long. So I don't tend to pin. If you wanted to, you can do. Or if you use one of your uh, fabric glue pens or some quilters tape, if you prefer. But I find it quite easy not to pin. And we're simply going to sew straight along the centre of the zip tape. And then the second half of the cover, if I just peel that back, is going to go right sides together. Make sure if you've got a directional fabric it's facing the right way. So let's flip that over and sew to the opposite side of the zip. I find that easier to do from the zip side so I can see where I'm sewing. And just line up the edges of your fabric like so. So we have this, and I'm just going to press that open, and I can actually chop off the ends of the zip now as well. Oh, before I chop off the end of this side, I'm going to sew the ends together, uh, and in fact, I'll put my standard foot back on my sewing machine now. Don't need the zipper foot anymore. And I'm just going to hold the two ends of that zip together and sew it backwards and forwards to hold them together. Um, if you're using a metal zip, I wouldn't recommend you do, but if you are using a metal zip, don't do this. You'll break a needle. So I've literally sewn the ends of the zip together and now I can snip that end off as well. So let's get my little ironing pad back out again. And again, this would be a lot easier on... My big ironing board, but you know, I'll have to disappear off for five minutes then. So I'm just pressing the fabric away from the zip, make that nice and flat. You can iron over nylon zips, just don't hover there for too long with a very hot iron because they will melt eventually. Okay, you go back up there, and then I'm going to top stitch just across the bottom. So I can lengthen the stitch again because it's not a seam, so I'm going up to 2.8 on my machine. When you come to the slider, lift your foot up, move that out of the way so you don't get wobbly stitches. And so. Right, I am just about out of thread at the bottom, so that was... That was well spotted. So I'm, going to, I'm just going to load up my bobbin and I shall be back again in just one second. Okay, now I'm going to take the top of my fabric and literally fold it over the zip. Now I don't want to go too far, else I'm never going to reach the zip underneath there. And I don't want to be too short because then you're going to see the zip. So literally just fold it until it just about covers, you know the top stitch you did, just about covered that top stitching across here. And I'll do that on my ironing pad and press it in place. So keep that nice and straight as you go across. Give that a press. So actually it doesn't matter what colour zip you use inside here. I could have used a bright red or a bright green for that matter because you're not going to see it. Try and keep that fabric straight.
And this only works, really, if you have the kind of zip that goes into the end of your seams. So if you've got a zip that's shorter, then this, this isn't really going to work. So now I've pressed that, I'm going to pin it from this side, because this is the side that I'm going to sew. So just a few pins along here to hold it in place. And then I'm just going to sew along the edge of the tape. It doesn't have to be close to the zip. In fact, the further away, the better, really. So, pins out as you sew. When you come to the zip, pull, lift your foot up. Have a forage around till you find it and move it out of the way. And then carry on sewing. So it's, it's a good idea to have a think about which way you're putting your pins in and from which side. So as you're unpinning, as you approach the pins, you can pull them out towards you. So we have that. So that's really nice and neatly concealed underneath that flap. Then we'll sew the two pieces together. So I need the zip open for this, not all the way, but just so I can turn this the right side out. And we're going to put the front section of the cushion cover facing the same way. So we're lifting the flap up on the back and right sides together like so. And again, the lining is far too big. That's absolutely fine. I would rather it that way and cut it down to size than risk it being too small. So we'll have a few pins in to hold this in place. And then zip a foot back on the sewing machine again. We did need it again. And we're going to re-sew close to the piping. So before we sewed up to the piping, now we need to be very close to the piping. We can always um, go back after this section, I'll show you that, and re-sew if it's not tight enough. So let's move that needle over again and start to sew. So you can see the stitches that you've already sewn here. You can also feel where the piping is. So I don't want to sew into the piping. I just want to sew very close to it. One of the important bits is when you come to the corners. There's, although I didn't stretch this, it does seem to have gathered up a little bit. So I'm just going to pull as I'm sewing. Not to distort it under the needle, but just to make sure it's nice and flat. And right up to that piping around the curve. Now we will turn this the right side out when we finish and just make sure I've caught enough of the fabric. Because at that point, I can say I missed that bit. At that point, I can always go back over again. I can actually feel like I came away from the piping a little bit there. So it is actually quite easy. And you know, it's, it's worth it because this piping, whoop, turn it again, really finishes off the cushion cover. Right, so let me take out the rest of my pins. And I'm just going to cut, oh, there's another one. I'm just going to cut back that lining fabric because remember it was a little bit too long. Now finishing seam wise, um, for me, if this is a cushion cover for me at home, I take my pinking shears and just trim around the edges to help stop it fraying. If you're going to give this as a gift or if you're selling what you're making, then a serger or overlocker would be a good idea. Um, and just go around the edges at this point or a zigzag stitch on your sewing machine to make it nice and neat. So right, what we need to do now is to turn through the corners and make sure they're nice and neat, like that. That's perfect. Let's just make sure they're all the same. I haven't edited this, by the way. <laughs> this one, you see, I can still see some of the original stitches. I need to be tighter on that corner, so I'm going to pop that back through and I'm going to do that one again. Have a look at this one. Makes all the difference though. That one's fine. And that one's fine. 
So it's just this corner I want to be a little bit tighter on. So I can simply go back to the machine and sew again closer to the piping. And you can keep doing that as many times as you need to until you have perfect piping all the way around. So that's lovely and I don't see those stitches anymore. So let's turn this the right side out. Another little press, I think, would finish it off nicely. And again, no matter how hard you try, sometimes with that piping, it tends to want to gather up, so we're just going to stretch it out and press it in place. Those are very wobbly scissors. The piping does make the difference, though, doesn't it? I think it gives such a lovely finishing touch, a professional finish, and it's really not difficult. It almost gives an outline to the, to the design. It frames your cushion cover. So it's not expensive. It may be a little bit time consuming, but it, it's all part of adding that really luxurious finish to your cushion cover, I think. Right, so that's all nicely pressed. So the final thing is to put my cushion pad inside. So there we go. This should fit nice and snugly inside here. Let's open up the zip and push it in. corners right into the corners. That's perfect. Now if you have um, a cushion pad that doesn't quite reach the corner, sometimes with the, um, the hollow fibre cushion pads, um, they don't have very pointy corners and it's difficult to actually squish the filling around to get it to fill. So what you can do there is that these baggy corners that are a little bit empty if you just take a little bit of toy filler and push them into the corner, that will make it look really nice. And that's not a cheat's way. I trained in upholstery a few years ago, and I was quite surprised, actually, the amount of packing and padding that went into the, the chair covers to make them square. But it kind of makes sense, really, doesn't it? I think that looks good. So let's close over the zip. That's neatly hidden inside that flap, so you have a very nice smart back to it, and that's the front of your cushion cover. Whoops, come off here. <laughs> one, one little stubborn thread. There we go. So again, I hope you like the cushion cover. I hope you enjoy making yours. I can't wait to see your pictures if you want to share anything on Facebook. I'm Debbie Shaw Sewing. I'd love to see your pictures there. If you haven't subscribed to my channel as yet, then please do. You'll be the first to get notifications of new projects that come on, and I'm, I'm trying to get them a little bit more regularly. Um, so if you do subscribe, there's no charge or anything for that. It just means you get an alert. If you click on the little bell shape, then as soon as um, we have a new project on there, then you'll have a notification that there's something new. And let me know what you think about it. Uh, but do try and, and put your own twist to this as well. I think that's really important. So add different colours and embellishments and maybe different shapes of, of baubles. But the most important thing is that you've enjoyed making yours. I'll see you again shortly. Bye-bye.